Welcome to my bell. What you're about to hear is not fact. I'm not trying to get you to believe anything. And the end goal of this video is simply to ask questions and spread curiosity. I'm not a professional, and I don't intend on spreading any misinformation as I'm not trying to claim that anything I'm saying is true. This is simply a thought stream that reveals an alternative story and perspective of the world that we live in. I do intend on talking about controversial subjects, however, I will not be talking about the modern day vaccine. This video has nothing to do with that, whether or not you should take it, and or whether or not it's good or bad. I know a video like that is not wanted by the YT authority and that's fine. I wish to present this in a light that is more historical and spiritual. I've demonetized this video and I plan on not breaking any rules. I presented everything in this video as questions. As long as freedom of speech survives, we should be able to look into the history of the modern day health establishment. Please refer to your local medical authorities if you have concerns for vaccines. I'm not a valid source of information and this is simply for entertainment and curiosity. It's just a fictional story. In order to understand this ideological perspective, you must understand the full spectrum of lies that have been pervasive throughout our entire lives. In recent events, people have really begun to see the amount of corruption that has infiltrated almost every industry. America is being flooded with Marxism. We are seeing the division of those who trust their government and those who do not. And the blatant lying media has become more clear than we've ever seen before. This is the time to re-question everything we know, for there is corruption in our education system, medical system, and our heavily altered history that favors the winners. Our education system gave us a very specific viewpoint of reality, a perspective based on materialism, randomness, purposelessness, and producing work-minded individuals that don't think outside the mainstream. A medical establishment that is based on the allopathic system of medicine that simply suppresses our issues instead of dealing with the root cause. What about the billion dollar industry of pharmaceutical companies that push the pills that numb all of our problems instead of solving the issue? Or even the historical perspective that mixes with our educational experience that transforms our cosmological viewpoint of reality. If you don't know your past, you don't know yourself. We have to dive deep and explore these topics outside of the mainstream narrative. For politics, many of the times, is the driving force behind certain events. Now, you may not like politics, or you may think it's all a distraction, and in most situations, that's very true. However, it does not take away that there are different ideologies of political thinking. In most European countries, you're right, the right and left are simply that of the same bird, the same head and hand. That's because most of the time, they really share the same underlying philosophy, more power to the government. There can be extremism on both sides. However, the ideology of more governmental power and collectivism is a belief of the left. And that belief is that we can have an equal utopian society where everybody is treated equally. Now, there's only one place in the world where the left and right are not of the same bird. Remember, we're talking about ideologies. I understand that the banks own America, we'll get to that. However, in America, we have a constitutional republic with a constitution that actually limits the power of government, not granted power like other constitutions around the world. When we're looking at the true left and right political spectrum, these ideologies are vastly different. The left wants the government to fix everything, while the right has much more conservative values. They value a free market and push for more individual rights. That's all I'm going to say. I have no intention on making this a video about explaining the political spectrum. I'm also not a Republican. I see myself as libertarian, if anything. It's important to not get polarized in this stuff. However, even anything that simply questions the left is now considered far-right extremism by the mainstream. And I'm sure some of you are saying, what does this have to do with the subject of this video? There are many subjects that are not usually connected that makes this all relevant. You kind of have to know this stuff if you want to understand what's happening now and what happened in the past after Tartaria. Collectivism destroys innovation, which then destroys the free market that then destroys liberty. This has been attempted before many times in the past, and it seems as if history is repeating itself. this chapter, you have to have a basic understanding of Tartaria or at least just know a little bit about it. Check out the series Tartaria Explained on our channel if you haven't seen it, but it's a long rabbit hole and very difficult to explain in a very short time, but I'll do my best. History and the timeline that we now know has been extremely altered and 
Not only that, many civilizations have been falsely attributed to other names that disguise the true people who lived in certain locations. Thousands of years were added to the timeline by the Catholic Jesuit priest, and the timeline that we have now is called Scaligarian history. They added an extra thousand years to the timeline to make Rome seem more powerful than it was. Check out Fomenko's work on alternative timelines. However, one of the major cover-ups by Catholic Jesuit priests who have also been called Phoenicians is that many civilizations have been erased from history and we know nothing about them, but they were pivotal in not only many of the cities and structures that we see around the world, but they also had advanced technology in flying vehicles. This Tartarian age is from before the 1500s all the way up to 1812. They had many major cities around the world, in Russia, Europe, Africa, and in America. Now, the Phoenicians and the Tartarians can be confusing because there are multiple ages or stages to this, and also mainstream history already gives us a history on the Phoenicians, so that makes it even more confusing. But the Phoenicians at their early stages were technically the Tartarians, but we will explain that more later. At some point, the Phoenicians, which is really a cover name for the advanced Aryan race, meaning noble men, became corrupted and began changing their ideology from that of the original priesthood of Ayesa to that of corruption and greed for power. This is going to get confusing if you haven't seen our series, so I'll keep it at that, but basically, there was a long war and the fall of Tartaria is a multivariable equation, for not only were there many cataclysms in our recent history, but that this happened in different stages. The Phoenician Venetian Jesuits began moving into Tartarian cities in Europe around the 16th and 17th centuries and began forming their empire to defeat the remaining outposts of the Tartarians around the world. This is a time of what we now call the Dark Ages, where the group of people called the Phoenician Jesuits had to rediscover everything by living in these Tartarian European cities. They also went around the world destroying any evidence of past advanced cultures that did not fit their narrative. This is why the old libraries, like the Library of Alexandria, were burned. Many of the famous cities around the world were actually built by this Tartarian advanced race, and the people who survived the cataclysm, the Phoenicians, began moving in and claiming that they built these cities, and we will go over how events like the Big Stink and London are indicative of how toxic our living habits were, and how these cities were not even built to handle massive amounts of sewage. Like I said, some cataclysmic event happened, so by this time in the 1600s, Many of these cities were empty. It seems that the two biggest remaining Tartarian empires in the 1700s were that of Russia and America. As the Phoenicians built their power, they built it based on combining the state with the religion and using it as a means of tyranny. This is one of the many reasons why people today are against religion. Not only has it been corrupted and used for political reasons, but that it was used to indoctrinate the minds of the masses into obedience. The Phoenicians began spreading this indoctrination around the world converting old abandoned energy temples from Tartaria into churches. They began their war on the peoples who they could conquer in stages and then convert them into their ideology of religious control, to use religion to make people fight for God. It took until 1812 for the Phoenicians to fully have control over the world and defeat Tartaria. For extra context here, the Phoenicians can be seen as a group or cult that began seeking power and fell to corruption. However, this group, the Jesuits, then took the history of the Tartarians and then renamed everything and made it their history giving it the name of the Phoenicians or Ancient Hebrews. Anyways, it's extremely difficult to unpackage that in a paragraph, especially because of the cataclysms and they became the Canaanites and converted ancient temples to sacrificial centers for Baal, but after the fall of Tartaria around 1812, many Phoenician families began pushing for a restructuring of society. Around this time, many leftover Tartarian civilizations were still in the US and we aren't told about this in history. There was a push by the Phoenicians, or now we know the Jesuits, to create a one world government. In order to do that, Tartaria needed to fall, in America, Europe, and in Asia. After the Phoenicians began moving into these Tartarian cities in Europe, they were emptied after some great cataclysm. Check out the videos to understand more, but they began rebuilding these structures for their own uses in society. This explains the weird ghost city photos of the 1800s, and the fact that it makes no sense that they built all these structures and moved massive amounts of bricks around on horseback. Most of these old photos are either staged and or edited. As they began to move massive amounts of orphans and people into these cities, they began having a push for the workforce. This was done globally, and we began to see the move of controlling people through the church and state, but instead to begin controlling the masses through economic principles and to start the push for science. 
The Phoenician Jesuit funded Francis Bacon, who wrote and edited the King James Bible, makes it very clear the society that they wish to create, which is a technocratic society that is based on the religion of science. Sure, to be fair, he proposed it in a way that meant a society that stayed true to the principles of science. However, we all know this simply means a society that is dominated by political science, the New Age Church. The Phoenician families are the true wealth behind the robber barons who are but a wing of this Phoenician bird. The Rockefellers and other wealthy bankers of the world, otherwise known as the robber barons, seem to have heavily influenced the rise of fascism in Europe during the 1800s. One of the most devious lies of history is that fascism is a product of the right. This couldn't be further from the truth, for every fascist in history was a verified socialist and promoter of Karl Marx's ideas. Which is why I alluded to the left and right in the beginning, because there was a reason that fascism failed at first. They tried too quickly to create their new world order, and it didn't work in their favor. Even though they absolutely still have control through the banks and industries, they just don't have the power. We do. And in order for them to have that power, they have to slowly convince us to give it to them. After the fall of Tartaria, there were still survivors and groups of people that resisted the full takeover from Europe within America. Even though they lost the war, they still began to form their own states and settlements and this is what we know as early American history. It's many leftover Tartarians with wealth, many rich free market minded businessmen who moved to America from around the world, and also these parasitic forces of the Phoenicians, or at least their branches like the Spanish, British, and French, that began making their cities in America and making the push for dominance. They did this by trying to dominate the free market. Their seemingly placed tycoon plants such as John D. Rockefeller, Carnegie, and J.P. Morgan. Remember, many of these cities, including the railways, were most likely found and so these people were creating a market with technology that had been rediscovered. This has to do with controlling the power energy source and the banks because through this you can control governments. Oil replaced the Tartarian free energy systems and they began creating engines that ran on this new fuel source. They took the railroads and capitalized on the transportation of goods. It's very suspect on how these families got so rich in the first place, and as we see how the Rockefellers influenced world events, it will become evident that maybe the Phoenician families have had their hidden hand in this. It wasn't just the market that got corrupted, but the banks as well. Through owning the banks, they knew that they could take over the economic structure and influence governments around the world. Karl Marx became prominent around this time because he reworked the ideas of utopia and communism in a way that separated issues based on societal class which would spark revolution in order to create change for the working class. However, for those with common sense, you can see that these ideas directly were responsible for the rise of communism, and it was also used as a means of a psyop in order to convince the working class to revolt in a way that would actually give the government more control and more power. The thing about Marx is, he just did intellectual gymnastics in order to make his message much more presentable to someone who belongs to a workforce instead of someone who's trying to create their own wealth. These Wall Street bankers, or robber barons, were in cahoots with Karl Marx, and it is well known back then that they funded and promoted these communist ideas. These bankers were directly responsible for funding Lenin and Trotsky and promoting the Bolshevik Revolution. This is very similar to what is happening today with the left. The Bolsheviks promoted the same concepts of equality and that it was the system that was actually evil and everything needed to be teared down and rebuilt again. They needed to install an entire new system and the answer was, what many people who signed up for this did not expect, the genocide of millions of people. Their ideas didn't work and there's never been a good example in history, mostly because many of these tyrants and Marxists do the same thing once they begin redistributing wealth. They just keep it for themselves. Then everything begins to fall apart. Innovation dies. The wealth eventually is spent on the political leaders who rule this new system. The same thing happened with Mussolini, Mao, Stalin, Hitler. These ideas of collectivism have failed every time and also were all ideologies of the left, not the right. So they decided to try a new method. They began just saying that they were republics even though they were not. They began giving the illusion of democracy, even though there is no choice. However, with freedom of thought comes freedom of values. And even though the Phoenicians have branched out to own every industry, they still could not quell the most prominent ideology of the peoples, which is conservatism. Most people are conservative and don't even realize it. We are innovative beings that want to create something new into the world. That is the foundation of capitalism and a free market. 
We're not talking about crony capitalism, which was created by the Phoenician elites to corrupt the free market, but just the ideology of having your own identity, building up your own wealth and structure, having your own independence. These are all values of conservatism, and you must understand that I'm not speaking of the modern sense of the word, meaning far extreme right, or at least the way the mainstream media likes to portray it. This is a big reason why their plans on a one world government have still not succeeded. You may think that they already own everything and it's all over, but we still do not live in a complete Orwellian dictatorship, tyrannical society. It may be on that path, but we're not there 100% yet. It now seems that the new path that they will take is dependence on the health establishment and this push for a global vaccination what some call the mark of the beast. Is this how they will reach their utopia and social credit score based economic system that is constantly monitored and tracked globally? In the early 20th century, both the Rockefeller and Carnegie Foundations were donating large sums of money to education and the social sciences. They supported, in particular, the National Education Association. By way of grants, they spent millions of dollars, money which was used to radically bend the traditionalist education system toward a new system that favored standardized testing over critical thinking, toward scientific management in schools. This was the part of the calculated plan to make the schooling system benefit corporate America at the expense of the American school children. Powerful foundations with private interests such as the Ford Foundation continue to support and thereby influence the policy of the NEA to this day. Additionally, an unprecedented U.S. congressional investigation into tax-exempt foundations identified the Rockefeller and Carnegie Foundation's engagement in an agenda for vast population control. Norman Dodd, research director for the Congressional Committee, found in this statement in the archives of the Carnegie Endowment. The only way to maintain control of the population was to obtain the control of education in the U.S. They realized this was a prodigious task, so they approached the Rockefeller Foundation with the suggestion that they go in tandem and that the portion of education, which was considered domestically oriented, be taken over by the Rockefeller Foundation and that portion which was oriented to the international matters be taken over by the Carnegie Endowment. Let's not forget. In our dream, we have limitless resources, and the people yield themselves with perfect docility to our molding hand. The present educational conventions fade from our minds, and unhampered by tradition, we work our own goodwill upon a grateful and responsive rural folk. We shall not try to make these people or any of their children into philosophers, or men of learning or of science. We are not to raise them up as authors, orators, poets, or men of letters. We shall not search for embryo great artists, painters, musicians, nor will we cherish even the humbler ambition to raise up from among them lawyers, doctors, preachers, statesmen, of whom we now have ample supply. Reverend Frederick T. Gates, business advisor to John D. Rockefeller, Sr., 1913. In 1717, the Prussian school system was established, and by 1890, this compulsory schooling was prominent in Europe and America. This is largely seen as a good thing, as we're told that the literacy rates in those days were minuscule at best. However, Webster's spelling book sold over 100 million copies before compulsory schooling even came about, and that's just one of countless books written during that era. Schooling was usually done at home or by the parents or a local schoolmaster for the communities. But once the Industrial Revolution came around, people started to have to move to the cities and the family dynamic was destroyed and rebuilt with the state school teachers taking on a more prominent role in the child's life. These lessons were not so much life lessons, but books written by the same corporations that owned the factories that they uprooted their whole lives to work in. People came dependent upon these big families who owned these companies. And these bigwigs know that they have complete control and their descendants will continue on their business, almost like a monarchy. Though it would make sense, since these very textbooks that American children are learning from are produced by a British company, a country with a long history of nepotism. 
In fact, John D. Rockefeller's father, William, was known by his neighbors as Devil Bill and was well known to be a con man and snake oil salesman. A man named Devil Bill was in charge of the education of the American youth. The current American school system took root around the turn of the century. In 1903, John D. Rockefeller founded the General Education Board, which provided major funding for schools across the country and was especially active in promoting the state-controlled public school movement. The General Education Board was not interested in encouraging critical thinking. Rather, its focus was on organizing children and creating reliable, predictable, obedient citizens. As the award-winning former teacher John Gatto puts it, school was looked upon from the first part of the 20th, 20th century as a branch of industry and tool of governance. The Rockefellers, along with other financial elite and their philanthropic organizations, such as Gates, Carnegie's, and Vanderbilt's, have been able to mold society by funding and pushing compulsory state schooling to the masses. Here's a timeline to show the radical shift in education and the influence of the financial elite. Pre-1840, literacy rates were still very high, schools prominently private and locally controlled. Up until the 1840s, the American school system was mainly private, decentralized, and homeschooling was very common. Americans were well-educated and literacy rates were high. 1852, Massachusetts passed its first mandatory attendance law. 1902, John D. Rockefeller creates the General Education Board. At the ultimate cost of $129 million, the General Education Board provided major funding for schools across the nation and was very influential in shaping the current school system. 1905, Carnegie Foundation for the Advanced Teaching is founded. 1906, NEA becomes a federally charted organization. 1913, Frederick T. Gates, director of charity for the Rockefeller Foundation, writes, In our dream, the people yield themselves with a perfect docility to our molding hand. 1914, National Education Association, NEA, alarmed by the activity of the Carnegie and Rockefeller Foundations. 1917, NEA reorganizes and moves to Washington, D.C. The NEA is the largest labor union in the U.S., representing public school teachers and other school faculty and staff. It generally opposes merit pay, school vouchers, accountability reforms, and more. 1918, every state requires students to complete elementary school. 1932, eight-year study, largely funded by Carnegie Corporation of New York and the General Education Board. This laid the groundwork for education reform and the schooling system we have today. 1946, Rockefeller Foundation grants the Education Board $7.5 billion. 1953, Race Committee of the U.S. House of Representatives reveal agenda of Carnegie, Carnegie Endowment and Rockefeller Foundation in Education. It seems incredible that trustees of typically American fortune-created foundations should have permitted them to be used to finance ideas and practices incompatible with the fundamental concepts of our Constitution. Yet there seems evidence that this may have occurred. Norman Dodd, Director of Research, Special Committee to Investigate Tax-Exempt Foundations in 1954. 1968, Edith Roosevelt's article, The Foundation Machine, index Carnegie-funded textbooks. Carnegie-funded programmed textbooks were distributed to culturally deprived areas. Edith Roosevelt stated that these young children are being indoctrinated with a pattern of anti-social ideas that will completely and violently alienate them from the mainstream of American middle-class values. 1979, the U.S. Department of Education was created. 1986, Carnegie Teaching Panel charts a new teacher framework and provides 900,000 in grants and reforms. The utter dependency on outside authority has completely destroyed the individual. Compulsory schooling does not foster problem-solving skills, innovation, creation, or anything that might possibly create a business competitor for the ruling class. Modern education Modern education is a business and has been since its inception. Why is there no plausible solution for fixing this education system? Because it was designed this way. It was designed to pump out students who will put all their faith in teachers and experts and none in themselves. The idea of a credit system is introduced at such a young age. The idea of a permanent record is always looming in the minds of the youth. The pressure to further pursue state-regulated education is also a big factor. How often do we hear things like, if you don't go to college, you'll end up a failure? Nowadays, however, people are realizing that this idea of specializing in one thing isn't a necessity to succeed. 
After spending tens of thousands learning a specific skill, and it turns out that either the market is oversaturated or highly competitive or even dwindling in a lot of cases with the advent of the ever-expanding reach of technology. The amount of turmoil some students go through in college is unimaginable. It is mostly internal due to the pressure oftentimes forcing themselves to do something that they are taught is profitable instead of what they are passionate about. This, this mindset is often seen as rational, but is it really rational for your mental state to force yourself to do something that you hate and are left paying off for decades? People who dislike their area of study actually become successful if they don't have a passion for it. We are afraid to raise our hands and ask our teachers questions out loud because we're afraid we'll get laughed at by our peers and our teachers. It's no different when you're an adult in the professional and social spheres. Our media like films, shows, games, social media influencers, the news, these are simply our new teachers, people from whom we take commands from in exchange for safety. And that's what the government claims to be, our protector of the people. And that's the allure of collectivism, safety. But it's a false state of safety and tends to be breed dependency and weakness, making us dependent on remote authority. The government is as much our protector as a farmer is a protector to his cattle. Sure, they protect, but only to a certain degree and only to end up using you as collateral in whatever plans they've got. We don't go to school for our benefit. Reading, writing, mathematics, that can be taught in a very short period of time. 12 years is far too long and reminds me of how the Spartans would take boys away from their families for 12 years to train them as soldiers. The war of the modern day isn't that of spear and shield, but that of mind and spirit, and the federal schools are the training field. Now that we can see that the banks, resources, energy production, education, and political views were hijacked by crony planted Venetian capitalists, otherwise known as the robber barons, we can now move on to our next section that involves how these robber barons hijacked the health industry. Now, we know for a fact in mainstream history that the robber barons were completely trying to dominate the free market and use this power to persuade governments. Now, we just need to apply that same logic to the health industry. In 1910, John D. Rockefeller teamed up with a school teacher and educational theorist named Abraham Flexner in order to change the way that the world would be taught about medicine. Andrew Carnegie joined and decided to use this as an opportunity for providing a solution such as pharmaceuticals, which began as byproducts of the oil industry. Together, they created the Flexner Report, which changed the way people healed from sickness. They promoted this concept of allopathic medicine and that educated medical professionals could help heal the world through science and medicine. What this achieved for the robber barons was a culture that enabled the monetization of medicine. Before the 1900s, they had very interesting ways of healing. Ancient practices, holistic healing, plant-based medicines, and sure, there were plenty of schemes, but there still wasn't an established health system that would dictate what health is and what is the best cure. There wasn't a culture of pharmaceuticals yet. This all started within the last hundred years. And the big point to take from this is not just that this was funded with a specific intention from the beginning, but that how could anyone truly believe that science has it all figured out? Scientists will say, oh, they don't. But then you explain why is there this big push and a very fast pace from multiple governments around the world to take a relatively new and experimental product that has never been truly tested? Where is the science and history that shows this is what's best for the human race? There were many prominent health figures at this time that possessed great knowledge about the body and the root cause of disease. Arnold Everett was most famous for his mucilus diet healing system. Everett authored books and articles on dieting, detoxification, fruitarianism, fasting, food combining, health, longevity, naturopathy, physical culture, and vitalism. People say all the time that these were just wackos and that people were just buying snake oil. But most of them are not being fair in the knowledge that many of these figures were actually healing people. Much different than what you see with modern doctors. On Wiki, it says he was an alternative health educator. These ideas are much more ancient, as we will see, and it is allopathic medicine that should be considered as alternative health. Let's not forget the works of John Harvey Kellogg on auto-intoxication. Many others around this time were well aware of why people were getting sick, but just like the oil industry got rid of electric and steam engines, they had to get rid of the figures that were actually keeping people healthy. 
If you're healthy, you can think more clearly. You begin to have more energy, which makes you more resistant. A tyrannical society must function on the civilians not being able to rebel. What better way to do that than to force dependence of health on the state that then is politically motivated and altered by crony corporation bankers? The history of vaccination does not begin with smallpox, but throughout history, many different cultures would drink the venom of snakes in order to become immune to its effect. This may have induced toxoid-like immunity. In the 1700s, the Chinese found a way to deal with smallpox by snorting powdered scabs up their nostrils. They found a way to suppress the disease. Let's ask, what is a disease? Well, a disease is a disorder of structure or function in a human, animal, or plant, but many times it is synonymous with viruses. A virus is a microscopic infectious agent that replicates itself only inside the cells of living organisms. Usually this has a perceivably negative effect on the host. Now, many people in the mainstream narrative have subconsciously been led to believe that this is but a force of nature or something that just happens randomly. Could it be that possibly there is a cause? According to Google, quote, naturally occurring smallpox was destroyed worldwide by 1980. In addition to flu-like symptoms, patients also experienced a rash that appeared first on their face, hands, and forearms, and then later appears on the trunk. There's no treatment or cure for smallpox, end quote. I will show in a later section what famous philosophers said about society. Is it possible that downfall and famine of mankind is a sign from above that we're not living in the right manner? Are we refusing to look at our signs and change our ways? It's truly a controversial issue because let's just say man did corrupt itself and it had something to do with diet. Many people are not aware of this and have simply been brought into this culture and way of life. What happens when a sickness comes to a society and everybody begins getting sick because of their compromised immune system? Well, for science and those who have no other answer, there can only be one solution. But is there another? People think they need the vaccine for a couple different reasons. One, they do what the government tells them to. Two, there are people who are aware of the government and media corruption yet still somehow trust the science. And I think this directly stems from cosmological indoctrination such as space and evolution and the trusting in science because it has saved humanity before, according to the history books we are given at the schools funded by the same people funding the vaccine manufacturers. Modern medicine perceives disease as a foreign thing. For example, I remember someone trying to tell me, oh, I remember back when I was younger, everyone was suffering from smallpox and polio and people were suffering and the only thing that saved them was vaccines. I was shocked to hear this person make this argument because he knows a lot about what's going on right now with the government and corruption within the media, but somehow he still thinks this way and I thought to myself, the only way I could explain this to him is that he has to understand how literally every industry has been hijacked, including the health industry, the space industries around the world, and our ancient history have all been infiltrated for political purposes. There are many stories that claim, not saying I am, that many people got polio and other diseases after they got vaccinated. I'm not saying the two are connected, that's your own rabbit hole to explore. Instead of taking that viewpoint, I think in order to understand why we get sick and what a disease is, we need to look at history and even myth. This all stems from our cosmological viewpoint of the world. Is disease a foreign virus or something that just comes from nature and it's science job to save us? Or are our diseases a product of our own societal actions and that it may be the waste and putrefaction from within our body that gives these diseases a place to thrive? Think about our culture, the way we think, the way we eat. People who are pro-vaxxers do not see the connection between diet and disease. People instinctively know that by eating better, you'll be healthy. But in the modern medical establishment, disease is seen as a focus on one particular issue and it's never truly connected with all the possible reasons that it could be happening. For instance, thought patterns and eating habits. We have been taught a diet and system of eating that's not actually healthy. Check out the Human Diet video 2020 for more info on this. Now, I'm not saying every disease in the world is a result of your eating habits, but that it stems from cultural and historical choices that we have made within the last 300 years. These will all be explained further, but I think the reason people have such an automatic reaction to 
conspiracy theorists is because they're unwilling to consider many of the things they learned throughout their lives may have been lies. The structure in which they perceive reality is beginning to topple and in their gut, they know this to be a little bit true. There's something more, but they would rather not let go of their previous beliefs for numerous different reasons. Then there's also the people who simply just think anti-vaxxers are stupid because we have science. Science has saved us in the past and all the information that we are receiving from the establishment is 100% the truth and anyone who navigates from this mainstream thought stream is just uneducated and ignorant. In my opinion, the latter has already made a decision and refuses to be curious anymore. They can't get into that state of being where they can perceive more than what they can consciously and logically conclude. However, there are different forms of rationalizing that go beyond just analytical thinking. One must learn to enter other states of consciousness in order to tap into their intuition and creative soul. Most of these people refer to anyone who refuses to accept an experimental government vaccine as an anti-vaxxer which directly stems from their cosmological viewpoint of the universe they live in. You see, these people are nihilist and believe that science has everything correct in terms of the perspective of the universe, that we came from a big bang and that we're just a coincidence that came about through randomness, that we evolved from monkeys and had to fight to survive. Sure, many of these people may believe in something more or multiple dimensions, but in the majority of these cases, these people have been indoctrinated with a very specific worldview, either consciously or subconsciously. That is the cosmology of materialism. In many of our videos, we've mentioned the cosmology of nothing and the cosmology of something. This is what we're talking about when we refer to different cosmological viewpoints. Yet, even the nihilists wake up and go about their day because they aren't really nihilist. Nihilism is not natural. No matter how much a person wants to not care, their minds won't let them. If nothing truly matters, then why does a nihilist get out of bed? They're at least curious to see how things play out. Many of these modern advancements in science are very recent, and we still have not seen the long-term effects of using these technologies every day. Yet, we trust it. We don't know how allopathic medicine will affect future generations. Will their immune systems be compromised without a dependency on the state? And this is an important point to make. It's not to say that science is evil, or that science is the bad guy. By saying science is the new religion, we're saying that it has become political, therefore corrupted. A common argument to anti-vaxxers who use this point is by saying it's stupid to call science a religion because it's simply the study of the structure and behavior of the physical world through observation and experimentation. But this is just a straw man argument for we're not attacking true science. We're attacking the mainstream established scientific narrative that was politically funded by many of the robber barons that we have mentioned. Try to apply what's happening in the scientific political atmosphere today to 100 years ago. Nothing is new. It's the same as when Christianity reigned as the main tool of the state. There's nothing inherently wrong about religion and spirituality. In its ancient form, you could make the same argument as pro-vaxxers do for science. Spirituality is simply the natural human quality to be connected and have experiences associated with the human spirit and or soul as opposed to the material physical realm. However, this ancient and natural tendency in humans was used by power hungry tyrants as a tool to control the masses. Science has also fallen victim to this treatment. Before, the Jesuit church used occult imagery to influence the masses into obedience, taking control of their right imaginative brains. Even though science is more analytical and based on real-world observation, they have used the complete opposite spectrum of the state control toolset. Now, the masses are stuck in left-brain nihilistic land where you have a much more difficult time accessing creativity and spirit. So pro-vaxxers believe they need vaccination because societies depend on it. They trust the science and that without it, we would have measles going on and smallpox all around the world and we would be helpless. But you see, this all stems from a belief that we came from evolution and that our ancestors had to fight to survive and that before the 1800s, everyone had short lifespans. They have been taught to think that the medical establishment has increased our lifespan and made it a safer place to live that they have cured us from deadly diseases because they nullified the symptom instead of just dealing with the source. Vaccines do not fix root cause, they just suppress it from happening again. 
instead of science doing trials and experiments to figure out why it may be that we get disease and or what are the long-term effects of doing this for every pandemic, they simply pushed through a shortcut. A shortcut that would have long-lasting consequences on a population. That's the issue. The dependence on a pharmaceutical establishment and the deterioration of our natural immune system. Pro-vaxxers think that disease and sickness is like some alien or foreign entity instead of being a result from our own actions. The problem that many are not ready to look at and refuse to accept is that it's our way of life that is causing these issues. The natives had no concept of disease until the Europeans came to America. That's because the people who came were corrupted Phoenicians that were living in old Tartarian cities without sewer systems and they had completely destroyed the entire city with shit including their internal digestive systems. Not to mention that there were cannibals, otherwise known as the Canaanites, they ate the flesh that was in most cases probably rotting. This led to an environment where horrible viruses and parasites could thrive. Over time, we were indoctrinated to think that this was the norm. However, this is sickness unveiled. For sickness is simply a product of the corruption within the body. Many times, that body is using the sickness to provide as a means for communicating with the user a sign to change their way of life or as a means for healing the body and protecting it against danger. However, with the new one world health system that seems to be coming, these symptoms will be suppressed instead of fixing the source, which is simply the way we think and eat. We are beings of light and our body was formed from nature, Mother Earth, which is Sophia. Your body is your body and you possess a natural healing mechanism that can rid you of all corruption. All you must do is be aware of that beauty and to change your ways. You must hydrate your body. You must rid it of all toxins. You must learn to heal naturally. One of the most prominent things that one of these pro-vaxxers will say is that we had a very short lifespan before science. This is something that needs to be addressed from an alternative viewpoint because there's many variables to consider. Well, to start off, many ancient cultures, myths, and legends refer to many different ages of the human race. You have the golden age, then you have that age getting corrupted and then the flood coming. Then you have this rise of awareness, the Aryan age, the Tartaria age of noble ones. And then after you have this destruction of fire that then leads to the restructuring of the modern age. So for most of the people who are pro-science and pro-vax, they're also following the mainstream history, which again says that we came from monkeys out of Africa and that the ancients did not have a long lifespan in general. In order to understand why we do not need to rely on science or political science really, is that there were ages in our past where we lived in great health and had extremely long lifetimes. There's no proof we would have evidence in the fossil record. Well, there are many cases in which artifacts do not fit the mainstream narrative and are forced into a specific history rather than truly discovering its origins. That's because corruption has infiltrated almost every industry. It's absolutely unbelievable and 2020 was the year to see it clearly. We all know that science and education has become extremely political. It's the exact same thing with history and many well-known historical events have either been presented in only a certain light and or edited to fit the winner. The Bible makes it clear that early humans had long lifespans and lived to be up to 800 years old in some cases. Not saying everything in the Bible is completely factual, but there are many books from that age that describe humans with extremely long lifespans, comparing to now. Many ancient writers make it clear that early ancient advanced civilizations, such as the Hyperboreans, had a very light diet that did not consist of eating animals. Remember, this whole perspective that we are meat eaters comes from this cosmological perspective that we were hunter-gatherers and we had to fight to survive. Those were simply stages after cataclysm where advanced civilization fell into chaos. Greek historian and philosopher Hellenicus claimed that the Hyperboreans, Celts, were a very just people living on acorns and fruit with no partaking of meat. Quote, when I go back, says Higgins in Anacalypsis, page 147, to the most remote periods of antiquity which it is possible to penetrate, I find it clear and positive evidence of several important facts. First, no animal food was eaten, no animals were sacrificed. Origins has left us with the record that the Egyptians would prefer to die rather than become guilty of the crime of eating any kind of flesh. Herodotus tells us that the Egyptians subsisted of fruits and vegetables, which they ate raw. Plinius confirms the statement, 
Harold Wrightstone in The Private Lives of the Romans says, quote, Of the Romans, it may be said that during the early Republic, perhaps almost through the 2nd century BC, they cared little for the pleasures of the table. They lived frugally and ate sparingly. They were almost strict vegetarians. Much of their food was eaten cold, and the utmost simplicity characterized the cooking and the service of their meals. Could this be a time in Rome before Cataclysm and before the Phoenicians came into the cities with their stink and bad health habits? The oldest inhabitants of Greece, the Pelasgians, who came before the Dorian, Ionian, and Elian migrations, inhabited Arcadia and Thessaly, possessing the islands of Lesbos and Lake Manas, which were full of orange groves. The people with their diet of dates and oranges lived on average of more than 200 years. This is confirmed by other Greek poets. Hesiod said, quote, The Pelasgians and the people who came after them in Greece ate fruits of the virgin forest and blackberries from the fields. Plutarch, the Greek biographer, observed, quote, The ancient Greeks before the time of Lycurgus ate nothing but fruits. Hesiod, one of the earliest Greek poets, often called the father of Greek didactic poetry, spoke of a fallen golden race who once lived like the gods. First of all, the deathless gods who dwell on Olympus made a golden race of mortal men who lived in the time of Kronos, when he was reigning in heaven, and they lived like gods without sorrow of heart, remote and free from toil and grief. Miserable age rested not on them, but with legs and arms never falling, they made merry with feasting beyond the reach of all evils. When they died, it was as though they were overcome with sleep, and they had all good things, for the fruitful earth unforced bare them fruit abundantly and without stint. They dwelt in ease and peace upon their lands with many good things, rich in flocks and loved by the blessed gods. This golden race descends spiritually and physically lesser each age. Plato, in the second book of the Republic, Socrates develops his idea of the diet best adapted to the general community. The work people will live, I suppose, on barley and wheat, baking cakes of the meal and kneading loaves of the flour, and spreading these excellent cakes and loaving upon mats of straw or upon clean leaves, and themselves reclining upon rude beds of yew or myrtle woes. They will make merry themselves and their children, drinking their wine, weaving garlands, and singing the praises of the gods, enjoying one another's society, and not begetting children beyond their means through a prudent fear of poverty or war. We shall also set before them a dessert, I imagine, figs, peas, and beans. They may roast myrtle berries and beech nuts at the fire, taking wine with their fruit in great moderation, and thus passing their days in tranquility and sound health. They will, in all probability, live to a very advanced age, and dying, bequeath their children a life in which their own will be reproduced. Then, Socrates proceeds to point out how the new ideal republic will become plunged into injustice and violence and fall into decay just as soon as it oversteps the limits of necessaries and makes the flesh diet and the acquisition of wealth objects of supreme endeavor. By this extension of our inquiry, we shall perhaps discover how it is that injustice takes root in our cities. If you also contemplate a city that is suffering from inflammation, whose people have been departed from simplicity, they will not be satisfied, it seems, with the mode of life we have described, but most have in addition couches and tables and every other show article of furniture, as well as meats and viands. We shall need swine herds for such a city in great quantities of all kind of cattle for those who may wish to eat them, then decline and decay. Does this not seem relevant to what's happening in our society today? Ovid remarks that Plato, doubtless, reached his great age because of his moral purity, temperance, and natural food diet of herbs, berries, nuts, grains, and the wild plants of the mountains, which, the earth, the best of the mothers produces. Pythagoras, alas, what wickedness to swallow flesh into our own flesh, to fatten our greedy bodies by cramming in other bodies, to have one living creature fed by the death of another. Leonardo da Vinci, quote, truly man is the king of beasts, for his brutality exceeds theirs. We live by the death of others, we are burial places. I have from an early age abjured the use of meat, and the time will come when men such as I will look on the murder of animals as they now look on the murder of men. Nikola Tesla, quote, It is certainly preferable to raise vegetables, and I think therefore that vegetarianism is a commendable departure from the established barbarous habit, 
that we can subsist on plant food and perform our work even to advantage is not a theory, but a well-demonstrated fact. Well, we all know about this and people joke about it all the time. I don't know what's true and this is not to be presented as fact, but to simply ask questions. What are the implications of global forced vaccination with passports and how does it represent the end of liberty and alternative health? Is more dependence on government a good thing? Are banks and culture moving to a more virtual and trackable currency? Have there been talks of a microchip or something that may be implanted into the body in the future and possibly be mandated by the government? Is it possible that the one world religion of the new world will be political science? In this new modern ideological war, do you trust the science? Many people sometimes get angry when hearing this information. They begin to think about how messed up the world is and start to have a feeling of despair. We must never give in to despair and always have hope. I think the solution and answer is to just keep spreading awareness, share this video, start talking to people about these subjects, and to really just stay curious about questioning the world we live in. The goal is to keep individualism and conservatism alive. I'm not saying to vote or fall into the trap of the polarized far political right. Be aware of the political battlefield of ideologies. Hopefully balance yourself as a libertarian and promote the concept of liberty, individual rights, a free market, and to keep government from getting too powerful or Orwellian. For as long as this ideology lives, it will always be a threat to a tyrannical society. Wish everyone the best and all I can hope is that our minds may be unveiled. Let go of everything you think to be true. Relax the mind and ask the question. Do I truly understand what this reality is?